Hello, everyone. Um, in this uh, brief presentation, I'll uh, discuss uh, a recent book uh, that I had uh, come out, published, named uh, Extraterrestrial, uh, that you can see in the middle of the first uh, slide here. Um, and if I had to summarize it, I would say, when you are not ready to find exceptional things, you will never discover them. This was the subject of a Scientific American commentary that I wrote uh, last year. What you see on the right side is a textbook, a thousand pages long that will be published in a month or so by Harvard University Press. Uh, and that would serve the scientific community searching for either microbial uh, life or intelligent life out there beyond earth. And what you see on the left is a photograph of a picture that was hung on the walls of the Berlin Brandenburg Academy of Science and Humanities. Uh, it was taken by the German photographer, Herlinda Quilbel, that came to my office and asked me to write on the palm of my hand uh, the most important scientific question that I can think of. And I wrote, are we alone? And uh, after working for several decades uh, in astronomy, uh, the, the most important lesson that I've learned is a, a sense of modesty. And uh, over the past few years, uh, both my parents passed away. So let me uh, explain uh, how I arrived uh, more recently at this uh, perspective by reading a couple of paragraphs from my book. My father, David, was laid to rest in the same red soil in which he planted trees all his life, in the vicinity of those plantations that he watered routinely near the house that he built with his rugged hands and that I grew up in, surrounded by the people he loved and who loved him in return, under the blue sky that I study as an astronomer. My mother, Sarah, who put me on the road to thinking as a philosopher with whom I spoke daily throughout my adulthood and who especially gifted me with a life of the mind, was buried beside him two years later. In astronomy, we realize that matter takes new forms over time. The matter we are made of was made in the hearts of massive stars that exploded. It assembled to make the earth that nourishes plants that feed our bodies. What are we then, if not just fleeting shapes taken by a few specks of material for a brief moment in cosmic history on the surface of one planet out of so many. We are insignificant, not just because the cosmos is so vast, but also because we ourselves are so tiny. Each of us is merely a transient structure that comes and goes, recorded in the minds of other transient structures. And that is all. So there is no escape, uh, if you look at the universe at large, from a sense of modesty, because we are born into this world just like actors put on a stage. And the first thing you notice is the stage is huge. It's 10 to the power 26 times larger than our body. And we have no idea what the play is about, but one thing we know is that the play has been going on for 13.8 billion years, and we just came at the end. So clearly this play is not about us. But nevertheless, people tend to think that the world centers on them. The ancient Greek philosopher Aristotle argued that, and people believed him for a thousand years because it flattered their ego. And when you look at a picture like this of a king that conquered a piece of land on earth and felt very uh, proud of himself, uh, you, you are surprised given the big scheme of things. Um, because about half of all the sun-like stars host a planet the size of the Earth, roughly at the same separation. We know it from the latest data that came from the Kepler satellite. And so there are more habitable Earths in the observable volume of the universe than there are grains of sand on all beaches on Earth. And so this king is not 
more impressive than an ant that hugs a single grain of sand on the landscape of a huge beach. That is not impressive at all. But I can understand where it's coming from, that sense of self-importance, uh, because uh, when my two daughters were young and they were at home, they tended to think the world centers on them and that they are the smartest. But then when they went to the kindergarten, they met other kids and got, and got a different perspective. And of course, if I were to ask them on their first day um, whether they would prefer to be at home or go to the kindergarten, they would much rather be at home and maintain their illusion that they are at the center of the world. So in a way, our civilization is following their footsteps. And the only way for us to mature as a civilization is to meet others. And I'm pretty convinced that when we do, we will realize that we are not the sharpest cookies in the jar. And by the jar, I mean the Milky Way galaxy. And that's based on the news that I read every morning. Um, it's quite obvious that we are not acting intelligently. We are fighting each other, trying to feel superior relative to each other, instead of cooperating towards a better future, which is the intelligent thing to do. Earth is our home, but only for a while. There are internal threats from changing the climate of the planet, uh, wars, pandemics, and other catastrophes, but there are also external threats from the impact of an asteroid or eventually in a billion years, the sun will boil off all oceans on Earth. So we need to go to space, spread our eggs in more than one basket. And uh, let me just say a few words about my journey from a farm. I was born on a farm uh, in Israel um, uh, to space. Uh, and so um, uh, I was born 59 years ago. You can see a picture of me in my childhood uh, on the top left. Uh, I used to collect eggs every afternoon. We had chicken, and you can see that in the second image from the left. I used to drive a tractor uh, to the hills of the village and on weekends and read philosophy books because philosophy addresses the most fundamental questions we have, and um, I was passionate about it. Uh, but then circumstances led me to pursue physics and astrophysics. And I ended up uh, as chair of the astronomy department at Harvard for the past decade. Uh, in May 2015, uh, a black limousine parked in front of the Center for Astrophysics at Harvard. And out of it came an entrepreneur from Silicon Valley named uh, Yuri Milner. He came to my office, sat on the sofa in front of me, and asked me whether I'm willing to lead a project to visit the nearest star during his lifetime. And I knew that the nearest star is four light years away. It takes four years for light to traverse the distance. And therefore, if you want to get there within 20 years, you need a spacecraft that moves at a fifth of the speed of light. And that's a thousand times faster than the chemical rockets that we have been using so far, uh, sort of like the jump from the first car that Henry Ford invented and spacecraft. That's the jump in speed that we need. And so I told Yuri I need to think about it. And then I recommended after six months, a method of doing that based on discussions within my research group. So here is a diagram of the solar system. You can see the sun on the left and then the planets, uh, and at uh, 100 times the Earth-Sun separation, uh, that's where the planets more or less uh, end. Uh, and um, that's also the place where the solar wind is stopped by the gas that fills in the voids between stars, the interstellar medium. But that's not where the solar system ends. That's where Voyager 1 and 2 are roughly at, but the solar system extends a thousand times farther um, into a, a volume called the, the Oort cloud, which is basically a collection of the bricks that were left over from the construction project of the solar system. So these are just rocks uh, that were thrown out during 
the buildup of the planets. And the Oort cloud is about halfway to the nearest star. The Alpha Centauri system has three stars. The nearest is Proxima Centauri. And if each star has an Oort cloud, they are touching each other, just like densely packed billiard balls. And when one star moves relative to another, it can dislodge some of these rocks into interstellar space. So this is an artist illustration of uh, Proxima Centauri. It's a dwarf star, 12% the mass of the sun, and uh, emits mostly infrared light because it has half the temperature of the sun, the surface temperature. Uh, and the planet, there is a planet next to it, which uh, happens to be just at the right distance to potentially have liquid water on its surface. It's 20 times closer to the star than the Earth is from the sun. And because of that, it's tidally locked. It has a permanent day side that faces the star at all times and a permanent night side. And my daughters say that if we ever go there, they would like to have a house on the strip that separates these two sides where you can see the sunset forever. Just imagine sitting on the porch and seeing the sunset. The sun would never set, basically, just on the horizon at all times. Uh, and since this star emits infrared light, uh, if there are any creatures on the planet, uh, they should have infrared eyes. And I asked students in my class uh, a few weeks ago if they know of any creature on Earth that has eyes sensitive to the infrared, and one of them found this uh, shrimp that does look like an alien to me. So how do we get there? And that's the method I recommended to Yuri Milner, and the project is called the Starshot. Uh, we in, uh, announced it publicly in the company of uh, Stephen Hawking in 2016. Uh, basically, the idea is to have a, a very thin, uh, uh, layer of uh, material, uh, sort of like a sail on a boat, except not being pushed by the wind, but being pushed by reflecting light. We call it a light sail. And uh, if you shine a very powerful laser of about 100 gigawatt for a few minutes on a sail that weighs about a gram and is roughly the size of a person, then you get to a fifth of the speed of light across a distance of um, five times the distance to the moon. And one can equip this sail with uh, uh, electronics, including a navigation device, communication device, and a camera. And here is an artist uh, illustration of that uh, concept. A sail is being released above the atmosphere so that it won't encounter the friction. And then a very powerful laser beam uh, is produced by, the, by a collection, an array of low power lasers that combine together uh, to push it for a few minutes to a fifth of the speed of light. And then after these first few minutes, it sails for 20 years towards Proxima Centauri. And one can release a sail every day. Most of the cost is, is in the uh, laser array. And of course, the journey is very long and quite boring. Uh, but eventually, when the sail gets there, it could take a photograph of the planet next to Proxima Centauri and send the photograph back to us. It will take another four years for that signal to reach us. But it could inform us whether the planet has life on it. And uh, the signal will be very faint. So we would need, uh, of course, a very powerful uh, telescope to detect it uh, after 24 years since the launch. So this is the concept of Starshot. And of course, one can imagine other targets, not just Proxima Centauri. And we are currently working on developing the technology. But it's not just the question of whether there is life. The most fundamental question is, are we the smartest kids on the block? And frankly, I don't think so, because if you look at recipe books, you see that out of the same ingredients, you can make very different cakes. And so what is the chance that out of the chemicals that existed on early Earth, we got uh, through random processes the best cake imaginable? 
But instead of arguing about it, we can just search. That is the best approach to figure out the answer. And the best place for us to look is in our backyard. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.